Semambo counted three accidents during the 15-minute drive from, from the National Museum to Kileleshua through Waiwaki, through Waiwaki Way and then Riverside Drive. The turned-off at the Kileleshua Shell petrol station and the boy, Jimmy, gave him directions to a large busy high-rise off Laikipia Road. Two girls loitered outside the grey building. Then a grey Mercedes-Benz drove up and both jumped in, waving and blowing kisses at Jimmy. The Benz almost collided with a Range Rover that was coming in. There was a slight breeze gathering leaves in the now quiet front of the building. It could not, however, drown out the frantic hooting of the main road right outside the block of flats. Samambo su suspected that this went on all day and night. Even from inside, one could see a large queue of walking silhouettes, probably going to Kawangware through the hedge, a parallel exodus of the walking and mobile classes. 1994, when Samambo had first come to Kenya, Kilelesho was still keeping up appearances. Now it seemed victim to all sorts of ugly aspirations and clutchings. Tall ice cream cake apartment buildings that crumble like Dubai chrome furniture after a few years. Will this be fine with you? I'll wait here for the photos, and we can discuss the gorilla talking lessons, Samambo said. You have to come in and meet my mother. She won't allow me to spend time with you if she doesn't know who you are. Samambo never used lifts. He bounded up the stairs, and he was, and was not even out of breath when they got to the flat. Claire, Jimmy's mother, was beautiful. A beauty of contrast, of failure even. Lines crossed her forehead, the crumpling skin astonishingly, astonishingly frail. Her mouth and jaw, perfectly symmetrical, trembled with drunkenness and skewed lipstick. She seemed on the verge of tears. Please come in. Samambo could smell the whiskey on her breath. The flat had an extremely low ceiling, and he had to kind of like stoop once he was inside. There were photos of three strangers, a young man, woman and boy in different settings. The young man in the photo seemed a sturdy sort, uncomfortable and self-conscious, with his hand held possessively in every photo by a clear 15 hard years younger than the, one, than the woman in front now. Everything had been chosen to fit this flat small specifications. The Cheng TV, the Fong music studio, the Sansam microwave, and the cracked glass table. Every appliance in the room was also on. Even somehow, even the small washing machine in the corner had some noise to make. But the TV was muted. It showed a crowd of young men, young men dancing with pangas, a shop in flames behind them. The washing machine gurgled as Dolly Parton sang in the background. There were, two there were two doors to the right, probably the bedrooms, Semambo thought. Could I ever see blankets underneath the other weaker two-seater two where Claire was now slumped, peering at him now beneath suggestively leaded eyes? Semambo was developing a grudging regard for the boy. Most teenagers would have taken on a long-suffering sullenness with a mother like that. Jimmy treated her like a slightly loopy older sister. Mom, the professor and I need to talk. Her face went black for a while. The mouth, her mouth trembled. I'm going to bed. You men are no fun at all. She went through the door that the boy had come from and slammed it. The TV now showed a soldier in fatigues, creeping against a wall, and then suddenly shooting two young men. I need some air, as Mambo said. Jimmy beckoned and opened the other door. A small room gave onto a narrow balcony that overlooked the parking lot. Samambo crossed over into the open and looked down at his hulking land cruiser down below. Some distance away towards possibly Kangemi, fires burnt into the night. Black smoke billowing towards the city center. The screams in the air were faint, the gunshots muted, as if coming from another country. Samambo looked out, listened, shook his head. While some fuss about whether to eat chicken or beef tonight, many won't see the morning. 
We are in their base, and their base is in us. I rise. In the depth of solitude, I am who I am. In the spirit of togetherness, I am Nelson Mandela. In the face of revolution, I am dead and Kimathi. In the wake of national pride, I am Kenyan. I am Somali by origin, and in the face of love, I am weak. A letter written by me, for me. Before being poet, before being human, I am poet. I strive to lead within the legion of wits, to dissent distancy and embrace love. I cry for my people. I cry for my people. I serenade my fear to give birth to courage, fuse language and my soul in this verbal marriage. I shine when gloomy, I blend in when glowing, I hit to the untold tale and when on stage I need to unfold a spell that cultivates in the mind. These words are but an extension of my might. I say what I want to say and you listen, you applaud. I do not want your clubs, I want you to listen. I turn a blind eye to social injustice, yet I pray my people are treated well. Do not look at me with that suspicious eye. You do not know who I am. I did not bomb your brother, father, mother, sister, uncle. I do not fight for any terrorist group. I am not a representation of a stereotype. You cannot blame me, yet I fear just like you, hurt just like you. I hide from the jaws of terror just like you. You struggle to understand me. Don't. I understand you. In the face of fear, you know no human. Your eye sees only who it suspects is friend or foe. I understand you because I know. I still rise, for I am who I am. A son who loves his mother is driven by ambition. Even Grisham knows it's past the time to kill onto the time to heal. You do not need to understand this painless persona. My words are my impractical scheme for social improvement. I do not curse, because when it hurts so badly, humans mistake the truth for profanity. I have hit my poetic falsetto. I spill the last few drinks. I spill the last few drops of this ink. I leave you with this poem, a temporary forever. You do not need to understand this painless performer. If you do not see the poem, it was not written for your feeble intellect. I take center stage, my words, my hell. I speak, I speak because I exist. I said I speak because I exist. You will find me next to your conscience. My words echo, my rants roar. My whispers soup, my cries beg for your embers. I sing to fallen angels. I am who I am. I speak because I exist. But before I exist, I am poet. It's nice to be back in Nairobi, a um, city that has made my novel change to uh, part of Kenya. Now, I've been described as an author that takes risks. And I'm going to take a risk on you. I'm going to read a part of my story that perhaps I would never read um, in public. But I've been told that you are a literary audience, that you could take anything I would throw at you. So I'm going to take you back to 1700 Buganda Kingdom, where we find Chintu, the title character, uh, having a father to son talk just before the son gets married. Thank you. Chintu was waiting at the fringes of the backyard. He stood near the wild shrub where, whose coarse leaves the family used to scrub pots. He was waiting for barley. Father and son were going up the hill to harvest honey. The collection of honey was Chintu's chore. Normally servants 
carried the torch on the way up and the honey afterwards on the way down. But this time, only Bali was invited. Bali joined Chint with a lead torch and two large gourds. He was a man taller than Chintu, though he still walked with a swagger. Bali had been reluctant to marry because he still wanted to clear up Tala like an untethered goat. <laughs> but then, three moons ago, he had surprised everyone by declaring that he was getting married soon and that no one was going to help him decide who, whom he was to marry. Bali had been a restless boy with a quick tongue and equally quick fists. Kalima had had a cooling effect on him. Every time the boys came home with Bali nursing a bleeding nose, Nakato would ask Kalima, what happened this time? Because Kalima's versions were more reliable. The fights had stopped about the same time as Kalima's departure. The initial mournful stance Bali had turned, after the initial mournful stance, Bali had turned into a brooding young man who sucked his teeth at everything. Recently, his twin mothers were worried that he was getting too close to the board. Chint was now glad that Bali was finally getting married. A wife and a home would soon use up that excessive energy that made him swagger. Sometimes Kaichi is in a mood. When the bees will not leave or when they are aggressive, go home, return when it's in a better mood. Chint worked delicately. The most important thing is to take only some, half maybe, just as you pick wild fruit and must throw back some to the wild, so you must leave honey for the bees. He withdrew a golden honeycomb and prepared to milk it. Do you know where you're going? She asked unexpectedly. Bali remained silent. So all that bee talk had been a preamble. Here was the real thing. Chintu did not look up. He let the honey slide down the calabash. Silence dragged on. Finally, Bali asked, What do you mean where I'm going? Women? Bali gave a short, irritated laugh. Of course I know where I'm going. Well, I'm not talking about the breathless girls you still weave behind bushes. You know, the ones that challenge. Show me your sun rising and I'll show you heaven. Who, before you even get started at quaking, I hear someone coming. Father, I'm known in this village all over. You can ask. Ask who? The girls? Of course not. But everyone knows I am. No one knows anything, Bali, apart from you and the alleged girls. You forgot I was once a boy, Chinto laughed. We put about stories conjured in wet dreams. After all, girls always deny. Now Chinto looked at Bali. I'm your father. Is everything working? Of course. No need to raise your voice, Chinto looked around. In the morning, do you wake up alert or drowsy? <laughs> A lot, Father, I rise. Well, so does my senile uncle. <laughs> Every morning he gets out of bed. However, either we beg or cajole. Sometimes he gets up, but moments later he's down again. I set off prompt. I'm steady. I was beside himself. When all you have are a few stolen moments with a jittery girl, Anyone will set off fast and steady. I'm talking about a real woman. When you have all night, when a woman makes you stand on your toes without relief, do you know that a woman, while you're at it, can fall asleep? And when you're done and say, well, come back, she snores at you. <laughs> Bali was silent. Come, hold this gourd for me. Put the fire out first. Take this gourd, place it near the banana leaf. Be careful, Bali. Now hold this one for me. And to notice that Bali's hands were shaking. I don't worry about women. I was like you. But with time, I worked them out. Now, you see, we Baganda, we don't leave the propagation of the nation to chance. You must know what you're getting into before we place our bead on Tongo's lap. Assure me that all is well, and I'll assemble an impressive team made of my brothers, my older sons, and my friends. Then we shall descend on Tongo's village and have family with style and pomp. But all that will be a show if you don't display something as impressive when she arrives. Obviously, I've never been married, so I don't. Now you talk like a man. Lift that jug. You sure you can carry it? 
We don't want to collect the honey and pour it at the doorstep. Be careful, Bali. You know what? Put it down. Go home. Bring someone else to help us. The way Bali fled down the hill made Chin to wonder whether he had been harsh. But he knew the pressures society put on men in marriage, and he would never send a son in it unprepared. Thank you. So how, how does it feel to be in Nairobi, launching King Oh, it's a dream. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that this book would ever come off my laptop. And I'm so lucky, because, you know, I traveled all the way to Britain to write mm -hmm. and find an agent and to get published mm -hmm. and get a huge pay, you know, and become a star. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. <laughs> the novels returned to Africa <laughs> and got published here, so it's fantastic. It's a key to won the Kwani Manuscript Project, Kwani Trust Prize for the unpublished novel manuscripts. Uh, yes. I think that was last, that was uh, November 2013? Yes. It was chosen from almost 300 submissions. Uh, maybe you could tell us why did you decide to submit your novel for this particular prize and uh, since since winning, how has how has how has that been? Um, how has that impacted your life, if it has in any way? Um, you know, I was willing to send this novel to the moon if they could have it there. So I was so lucky when I finished it, and I I saw the um, the manuscript call out. Mm -hmm. At first, I I was too late. And I thought, well, um, it, I can't send it because I needed to read it okay. again. But then they uh, extended the date. So I, I read it and sent it over. But of course, my life has changed uh, since I, I won the manuscript prize. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just say I won a prize and the doors open. It's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And this is a prize that happened in Africa. But even when I went back to Britain, now people looked at me with respect. I know. <laughs> and you have since won the Commonwealth Prize as well? Yes, it was the confidence. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, if the novel has won the manuscript, you know, just, just throw in a few stories mm -hmm. and see, you know. So when I was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize, I thought, wow. <laughs> so the story, like you mentioned, begins in 1754 and we meet Kintu. Peter. Yes. Um, but then after the first book, we move forward to 2004, where the narrative becomes that of his descendants. Yes. So at what point did you decide on this, on using this kind of structure for the novel? And maybe could you say something about the importance of the relationship between past and present, historical and contemporary in King Um I can't say exactly, because I've spent 13 years on this oh, novel. Uh -huh. So I can't tell you that this was the point at which I decided that this book is going to take this form. Mm -hmm. And actually, I don't think I decided that this book is going to take this structure. It's just that I had these characters yeah. and they were structured like that. Mm -hmm. However, perhaps one of the most influential aspects was that I was doing post-colonial studies. Mm -hmm. And post-colonial studies, of African literature have a way of limiting your imagination to the arrival of colonization or the arrival of Europe. Mm -hmm. So when you read most of the writing coming out of Africa, it doesn't go beyond the arrival of Europe. It's as if Africa didn't exist before the uh, colonizers arrived. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this is interesting. And I was resisting post-colonial theory anyway. So I thought I would put all my frustration in the novel. So I, I, I went back into oral history. And th this is the beauty of it, because all the history of Uganda before Europe arrived were oral. Mm -hmm. So they have been told by word of mouth. And therefore, they are not static. You can do whatever you want. So I changed things, you know. Uh, things that happened in the uh, 1600s but are interesting. I brought them in 1700s yeah. and things that uh, were not interesting, I got rid of them. Uh, nobody's going to tell me, you know, that's not true because 
Were you there? No, 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 no. <laughs> what inspired me was my dad's mental illness. Okay. Uh, my dad was arrested during Idi Amin's regime mm -hmm. and was brutalized. And uh, we were lucky we got him back. Most of the, the kids at school would come to school and say, my dad disappeared. And dad never came back. Mm -hmm. But mine was found as soon after he lost his mind and he never came back to, you know, sanity. He was aware of me as his daughter and he always insisted that I do literature at mm -hmm. university. But he, he was never there. So I thought I would explore this insanity. But when I arrived in Europe and I watched TV, you would see Africa, and sometimes Uganda being portrayed on TV at this place of madness. Mm -hmm. I would look at the things, you know, the Ugandans were doing, and I'd say, that's not Uganda. We don't behave like that. I just don't know where the media in the West get their story. But for some reason, they go to Kampala, go to the dirtiest part of the city, and they pitch their cameras and take pictures and then they parade them. And it, it, it's, it's just so frustrating when you're mm -hmm. there. And so I thought, well, Africa is a place of madness. So it moved away from my dad and slowly moved into Uganda, moved into Africa, you know, to play with this perception as this mad place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that your sister said the same thing, like she was quite surprised at you, at the, at the, at the book. Yeah. Um, my family is absolutely traumatized. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't... First of all, most of them didn't know that I had gone to write. You know, in Uganda, you don't write. You don't do creative writing. I mean, it's not a subject. And what are you going to do when you come up? You're going to die, poor Jennifer. <laughs> so, uh, when I, read, uh, I left to go and do creative writing, and I didn't get a scholarship, my friend said, you come here, you work, you pay your fees, and you'll do a degree. So when people asked me, oh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to do an MA. <laughs> that I didn't say it mm -hmm. was creative writing. So people at home had no idea mm -hmm. that I was writing. Mm -hmm. And then I won the Kwani Prize, and they said, yeah, a bit, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I, yes, I've won this prize, but I didn't go into details, because mm -hmm. I didn't know whether it would be really successful. So suddenly I win the Commonwealth, and the drive to promote it is huge, and so my family stops, stops and thinks, oh my God, she's a proper writer, and so I bring Kim to, to ride along the Commonwealth mm -hmm. stone, and so my sister buys the book, and she read it and threw, then she read the prologue and threw it down and said, Jennifer, is something wrong with you? <laughs> and I say, well, is there anything there that does not happen? She said, oh yeah, it happens, but you don't have to write it so like that. <laughs> and I said, well, every time you see somebody murdered, remember he, he's like chained to. And then she met other people and she said, but what is wrong with you? So at the moment, people at home, they wonder whether I'm mad or whether I'm okay. I'm fine with it <laughs> because of reading the book. Yeah, they just cannot believe I could do that. That was the content. The content. They thought, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my sister, I think she thought I've written about her, I've written about <laughs> her childhood. So I think she was sad she didn't see herself in my book. Can you tell us something about uh, the writers or people in your life that might have inspired you to become a storyteller, to tell stories? Um, at first, it wasn't so much the writers inspiring me. Uh -huh. I, I had a very funny upbringing. Well, from age two to age eight, when my dad lost his mind. Uh -huh. At first, I was with my grandfather. And in my grandfather's home, we just told stories. And he used to tell, you know, he would tell a story, and then I tell it, and then he encouraged me to dance and still sing the song, just like Yoanda you, you did. Um, but then I moved to my dad, and my dad was one of those colonized soul. He believed in Shakespeare and in Dickens and 
Leo Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. So he started me quite young on the abridged forms of Dickens and whoever. Mm -hmm. the but then I would go back to my grandfather. My grandfather, he, my father would pack books that I would read during the holiday. And my grandfather would say, forget it, put them away, go out and play, we'll tell stories. So I grew up with my grandfather telling oral stories and my dad, you know, you know, feeding me, force feeding me uh, on Western literature. And at first it was like there was um, attention, my grandfather or my father literally. But I think when I started writing, I realized that, you know, they were just working together. Oh. So it's, it was mainly that reading when I was young. Um, but otherwise, like all African writers, I, I grew up with Nguji Wafionga, with uh, Chinu Achebe, and a lot of South African writing. So in your writing, is, it, uh, are you, are you, is there an intention to present another version of, of how women are, of how women can be? Because I, I, oh, again in the book, um, Kintu tells his son, thinks rather that uh, he needs to know that not all women are, are uh, that not all women are, yes, uh, women. Yeah. Yes. So is it is it a, was it a, is it a conscious intention that you have in writing that I want to present women in a in a different kind of way, or is it is it yeah? How would you say it is when you when you're drawing character? Um, it's mainly because Baganda women are like that. <laughs> and uh, in fact, in Uganda, other ethnic groups say, don't marry those women. <laughs> They're thieves. Um, they don't make good wives. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's always been funny with the women in my tribe. Mm -hmm. Because, um, first of all, if you go back in history, those figures, the, uh, the princess who killed a king and installed another king. They are out of history. But you know, um, when oral stories are told, especially history, they are much cleanest. So the whole of Buganda Kingdom is told in terms of the kings and the chiefs. Mm -hmm. Those women are missing, but it's only in their names. Mm -hmm. So this woman is called Nasoro. Nasoro solo means animal. Mm -hmm. So it was, she had done something. Her brother was killed, and she was she ran away to protect the other brothers. But in the end, she said, "I'm not going to hide." She came back, killed her, the king, and installed her own brother. You know, um, but that shaped Buganda Kingdom. Mm -hmm. But you don't find it in uh, in oral history. And the other woman <coughs> was called Nabulia. So in Buganda, if your fa your son was king, you are king mother. You had a court. You had power. So the, these women, the mothers, rather than the grandson inheriting, they encourage brothers to kill each other, take over the kingdom. So when so the older son takes the, uh, the kingdom, when he seems to be getting weak, she gets with the younger son and says, mm, we are losing it there, do something. <laughs> so the brother takes over, she gets another reign. You know, so she, that woman Nabria did it three times, mm -hmm. and she was, you know, uh, the 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 this strong uh, mother, king mother. And however, these are not again told. And I thought, you know, the world needs to know about these women. Mm -hmm. When you write strong women, I don't think that I should just write about the strong women who are good and they go out and earn money. Mm -hmm. I will write about the strong women who are known. You know, who are not role models, but they are strong. Mm -hmm. So it, it was not necessarily me going out and saying, I will write about strong women. Mm -hmm. Those are the women I've grown up with. Wow. Mm -hmm. okay. It's very powerful. So what advice would you have for budding writers, or people who are wanting to um, yeah, make a career out of writing? Um, normally, writers actually know what they need to do, mm -hmm. but sometimes they are just um, in a hurry. I was in a hurry. I thought I would go to Britain, tell my story, win the biggest prize and say hallelujah, she's arrived. The reality is you read and you read and you read some more. And then you choose which reading you should do. 
personally, for the last 10 years, I've only been reading writing coming out of Africa. I don't care how good or how not so good a book is. But I wanted to make sure I don't duplicate material. I wanted to make sure that uh, if something that I'm doing has been done, can I do it differently? Can I bring new light to it? I also made sure that, um, you know, uh, the, the, what is current now, you know, some of the subjects that, or things that African writers are doing uh, now could not be done in the past. So you don't write like Achebe now and get published. You have to read people like Chimamanda and see, okay, this is how she writes. Can I, what can I take from her? What can I leave? And then, um, apart from reading, join groups that write. And perhaps one of the most important things is when people tell you that your piece is not working, believe me, it's not working. And you're very, very lucky they've told you it's not working. If you're the kind of author that is told that this piece is not really good and is torn out crying, forget it. It's not going to happen.